let's try some thinking about trigonometry with the resources I've shared. In fact, try an exercise for me. Shut your eyes. Uh, you don't have to shut your eyes if you don't want to, but you could try this with your classes and sometimes it helps to de reduce distraction if you ask them to shut their eyes. And ask everyone, uh, and including yourself right now, visualise please in your mind a circle. Uh, in fact, a circle centre on the origin, centre zero, 0, with radius 1. So for those in know, I'm talking about a unit circle. Check, you can see that in your mind's eye. And in fact, put a blob on the outside edge of the circle, the circumference, and check that blob can move around. And the question I'm going to ask you, and maybe you could ask your classes, is what points, what coordinate points does that blob go through as it moves around the circle? Could you name any of them? And let's cut a long story short. Uh, it's an interesting exercise, actually. A lot of people struggle to name any at first. Uh, a lot of people claim it goes through the point 1, 1, and maybe it's like at 45 degrees up. It doesn't doesn't go through that point, not even close. And some of you will be aware of that too, I'm sure. It goes through the point 1, 0, and 0, 1, and negative 1, 0. In fact, they're top and bottom, left and right sort of coordinates. And the other ones in between are actually not super obvious. Now, you could string out an activity like that as long as you want, really. It's quite useful to have some visualisation in a classroom in your mind's eye. It's a skill mathematicians use. Sometimes no one's going to examine their mind's eye imagination. What it's also doing, though, is getting a class familiar with an image which is going to be a recurring image for this topic, which is the topic of trigonometry. Now, you don't have to tell them it's trigonometry if you're introducing it like this, but let's cut to the chase and let me show you the file I'm going to use to sort of support this visualization. So here is what I'm calling the trig tracer, and on the left over here, you can see that there is a unit circle. In fact, there is a blob that moves around it, and it's a little bit more precise than maybe in my mind's eye. And there's an angle between the x-axis and that radius, and maybe you could have added those features into a visualization version as well. But the point is, they can go all the way around, uh, and that is what I'm going to use to talk about this. And the art of asking about the coordinates is actually, well, it does go through there and there, but those coordinates may be not obvious along the way, but things moving in circles must go through coordinates. And uh, if I just focus on the Y coordinate for now, I'm going to click this tick box. That line there, the length of it is the Y coordinate of the point moving on a circle. And how does it move? Well, it starts off down at zero and it moves up to one here, but in that shape. And if it goes all the way around, it goes down here. And I hope you're not surprised to see that this is a sine wave. In fact, Maybe the definition of the sine function is it's the y coordinate of a point moving in a circle. And this file makes it very easy to see that and to see the sine wave graph that results from it. Um, and I hope that's a useful thing to have in your toolkit as a maths teacher. This is literally the sort of origin story of trigonometric functions. They come from describing things that oscillate or move in a circle. And since everything oscillates or vibrates, whether you're talking about sound or quantum theory, trigonometry is super important. It's not just about triangles, although you can see a triangle that's coming out of this diagram, and it's a right angle triangle, which is where the name trigonometry comes from, trigonometry, measuring trigons or triangles. You will not, I hope, be surprised to realise that the x coordinate has a similar flavour, and that is the cosine of that angle. Uh, and that makes a graph like this that I'm sure you're familiar with too. It's really nice to see that sine and cosine are sort of like, they're not mirror images of each other, but they're sort of like matching pair, which is why the name sine and cosine, it goes with sine, uh, is etymologically um, complicated, but those two sort of phrasings are useful to see. And the graphs are also useful. Now at GCSE, they do need to know the graphs. And to be honest, by the time they hit A-level, if they don't regularly sketch those graphs in a margin, they're probably going to get unstuck. Uh, the point about this file is it carries on. We can also visualize other trig functions. So let's put the tan function on here. And let me make a little spoiler warning here. There, there are two options for the tan function. So here's option one. Uh, the tan function actually is coming from a tangent, which is nice because it's named tangent after all that. Uh, the tan function actually is measuring how far up the radius would meet the tangent from the point one zero. So you can see that green line starts off at zero and it goes all the way up to infinite there, which is why the tan graph is infinite there. And then if you extend the radius, it'd have to go backwards uh, down there to reach it there, which is why the tan graph function goes negative. And that's how the tan function works. And you can see the graph turning up over there on the right. Now, a lot of people don't use this one, although I like this definition of tan because first of all, it involves a tangent, which it really should, and that's why it's got its name. But it also captures the, the negative behavior. So tan does go negative when you're over here, positive again there, and negative again there. So the height of this dot is what's giving you the tan result. A lot of people prefer this version of tangent. When I, I, I understand why, so if you draw the tangent at that point that moves around, the distance from where that point is to where it cuts the x-axis is also the tan function, except for the fact that 
it has to be negative over there and that's fine it looks like it's hitting the negative side here that's fine but then it's got to be positive there and it's still hitting the negative side so that's confusing it's got to be uh, negative again there so th the nice thing about this is it's drawing a tangent at the point you move around but the bad thing is it's not capturing the positive and negative behavior uh, so actually i usually prefer that one although they are equivalent and it's a good exercise to try and prove they're equivalent particularly if you're teaching an a-level class that's into that sort of thing uh, now jumping quickly to further maths if you're teaching further maths you'll be aware that there are three other useful trig functions very much related cosec sec and cot and they are the reciprocal of the the original three sine cos and tan and what's nice is they're also really visible on the diagram so let's uh, let's leave it on the alternative tangent for now the, it doesn't really matter for this bit but for cosec uh, which is one over sine it's got to somehow be the reciprocal of that blue line and that actually looks like this if sine is uh, is very small then cosec is very big uh, and it's going through this point here so it's the distance from the origin up to where the tangent from a cuts the y-axis and you see that tangent line that we talked about with the alternative tan is kind of useful because it's needed for these uh, reciprocal functions. But you can see why sine and cosec are sort of balancing each other out. And when sine is one, cosec is one, and then it gets infinite. And you can see why the graph of cosec does what it does over here because of that. Something very similar happens with sec. It's just on the x-axis this time. And there's the sec function where that tangent line intersects the x-axis. Uh, and what about cot? Well, you probably can guess since cosec and sec are sort of like the other way around from sine cos and cot is just the other bit of that tangent line so it's that green line the distance from a up to the y-axis not the x-axis so it's really nice to see the all of these on the diagram um, if you wanted to see the alternative version it's actually tan is the vertical one and cot is the horizontal one along that radius from the the, the tangent at the point zero one instead of one zero they're completely equivalent i prefer the one that captures the negative behavior of the graphs um, but actually it's quite useful to have this one sometimes because you can see more triangles in this arrangement and i've put some notes in the text file about how you can get identities out of this thing so sine squared plus cosine squared is one famously that's straight out of this diagram and all of the other a level trigonometry identities can be got out of this diagram too okay that's it for this one let me quickly show you the other two files i've included the second file i included is where you want to point out that actually if you're going to move a thing around a circle it can go around more than once so around a circle this way you get to 360 and then the previous file would stop and repeat the graph but actually keep on measuring the angle and you get past 360 and the graph carries on so while this is sort of jumping a little bit you can see that you can create the graph of sine for example from beyond 360 uh, both positive and negative and that's what this is doing you can let this animate so you can sort of fill in the gaps and this is a really important idea which makes sense in terms of the circle you can go more than once around a circle and you you could be keeping measuring the rotation all the way and that's why these graphs can carry on so it is quite useful to show your students that graphs don't stop at 360 or in fact at zero you can go negative um, angles as well and that's really important when you come to solve trig equations because this entire graph uh, you might need more than just between 0 and 360 to calculate the angles that you need to, to be valid so this works also for cosine you can see you can turn on the cosine one and we'll get the cosine graph and for the tangent I, this one is not doing the sec cosec and cot because once the principle is there i think the idea is pretty easy to extend to those um, if you want to just see the full graph instead of these traces then you can actually turn on those graphs as well you can see that these graphs repeat they have different periods and you do need to get your students aware how those repeat but at least you can understand why they repeat and the way they repeat uh, in the context of the unit circle i hope quite usefully the third file i link to is really an extension of the idea of multiple solutions so here i've got it actually just from negative 360 to 360 uh, and i haven't made that range adjustable uh, in this file you could if you want to go and change the file but the point is if you put a certain sign value so here i've got a sign uh, sine of 42.01 degrees and the sine value is 0.67 there are two places on the circle where that sine value exists and one is at 42.01 and the other one is over there somewhere and you can see from the symmetry of the circle roughly where it would be it'd be 42.01 degrees up from halfway around uh, but it would always be that sort of reflection thing and what you can see on the graph is that where that horizontal line which actually happens to be at 0.6 now crosses the graph we've been building up over the previous two files those are where the solutions are and however far that graph goes you're going to be able to read off solutions and this is a very important idea for solving trig equations there are infinitely many solutions so you have to limit the uh, the range or domain depending on which way you're talking about it to to know which solution is you really after so you can do this for sign there will always be two places on the circle uh, so even if you're going between 0 and 360 there are still two solutions uh, unless you're there in which case there's only one and so on and so forth 
but if the domain is even bigger than 0 to 360, then there's going to be even more. And for each full rotation, there will be two. Similar for cosine, you can see, but this time it's the uh, after the x coordinate. So the other one is sort of mirrored around the x axis, and it's always down there if this one starts up here. Um, it's slightly harder to see the graph directly translating because it's not the vertical distance, which is how we plot graphs. So this one doesn't quite follow as neatly as the sine one does, where that line matches up. But the same idea is there. There are two solutions on the circle for cosine, uh, and that's why there's two solutions in the 0 to 360. And if you have a long longer range, then there are going to be more solutions. And what's nice about the tan one uh, is that you can always see that the other solution is around the circle literally 180 degrees or pi radians around the circle for it to give you the same tan value. And that's why this is maybe quite important to use this definition of the tan thing. Otherwise, it's less obvious when the values are positive and negative. So I really like this one. The next solution is 180 degrees further around and so on and so forth. And that's why the tan graph has a period of 180 degrees or pi radians. So those three files, I hope they're useful if you're exploring trigonometry with your classes. At, to be honest, whatever level um, this is particularly A level by the time we get to this stage, but introducing the idea of the unit circle, the earlier the better, even if they're not going to be tested on that. Enjoy exploring trig functions with these files.